Menlo Atherton High School, in an affluent California community, is considered to be very good academically, at least by current standards, in an era of dumbed-down education. Yet its problems are all too typical of what is wrong with American education today. A gushing account of the free breakfast program and other giveaways to lower-income students who attend this high school recently appeared in the San Francisco Chronicle, while the Wall Street Journal presented a sympathetic account of the school's attempt to teach science to students of very disparate abilities in the same classroom. Even more revealing, the villains in this story, as seen by both the educators and by the reporter for the Wall Street Journal, are those parents who want their children to get the best education they can, instead of being used as guinea pigs for social and educational experiments. Creating a science class that included students of very different levels of ability and motivation was one of these experiments. These disparities were especially great in this particular school, since its students come from both highly educated, high-income families in Silicon Valley and low-income Hispanic and other minority families from the wrong side of the local freeway. Moreover, they were fed into the high school from their respective neighborhood schools with very different standards. The science class turned out to be a disaster. While the principal admired the good intentions behind it, he also admitted it was almost impossible to pull off in real life. The disparity was too great. Yet, the science teacher blamed the ending of this experiment on affluent parents who really didn't give it a chance. And the principal spoke of the heat he got from such parents who thought their kids were being held back by the other kids, that their children's chances for MIT or Stanford were being hampered. This was seen as a public relations problem rather than as a perfectly legitimate complaint from parents who took their responsibilities for their children's education seriously, more seriously than the educators who tried to be social workers or world savers. In a school where 40% of the children are Hispanic and 38% are white, sharp income and cultural divisions translate into racial or ethnic divisions plainly visible to the naked eye. This also arouses the ideological juices and emotional expressions of resentment, both inside and outside the school. Stanford University's School of Education is reluctant to send its graduates to teach at Menlo Atherton High School because the latter doesn't make enough effort to overcome inequalities and uses politically incorrect tracking by ability to keep affluent kids protected from the other kids. In other words, a school that takes in 15-year-olds from radically different backgrounds is supposed to come up with some miracle that can make them all equal in ability, despite 15 years of prior inequality in education and upbringing. Somehow, there are always magic solutions out there just waiting to be found, like eggs at an Easter egg hunt. Make-believe equality at the high school level fools nobody, least of all the kids. White kids at Menlo Atherton refer to the non-honors courses as ghetto courses, while a black kid who enrolled in honors courses had his friends demand to know why he was taking that white boy course. If you are serious about education, then you need to start a lot earlier than 15 years old to give each child a decent shot at life in the real world, as distinguished from make-believe equality while in school. Ability grouping, or tracking, so hated by the ideological egalitarians, is one of the best ways of doing that. If you were a black kid in a Harlem school back in the 1940s, and you had both the desire and the ability to get a first-rate education, it was there for you in the top ability class. The kids who were not interested in education, or who preferred to spend their time fighting or clowning around, were in other classes and did not hold back the ones who were ready to learn. Our egalitarian dogmas prevent that today, destroying low-income and minority youngsters' opportunities for real equality. A mind is indeed a terrible thing to waste, especially when it is the only avenue to a better life. It caused twinges of nostalgia when I read about Stuyvesant High School's classes of 1947 and 1948 holding a joint 50th year reunion. 
I went to New York Stuyvesant High School, but by 1948, I had dropped out and was getting my education from the School of Hard Knocks. The most startling part of the story was that Stuyvesant High School now has an Olympic-sized swimming pool. No way could the old and battered school that I went to have such a thing. This was a new and palatial Stuyvesant at a new location overlooking the Hudson River. The school I went to overlooked the tenements on the Lower East Side. Stuyvesant is and was something very unusual in American public schools, a high school that you had to pass a test to get into. Back in my day, only about a third of those who took the test got in, and our junior high school in Upper Manhattan limited how many would even be allowed to go take the test. The Bronx High School of Science used the same test as Stuyvesant, while Brooklyn Tech used an even tougher one. While such schools have always been rare outside of New York, and have come under increasing political pressure to be more open even within the city, they provided both the poor and the society with golden opportunities. You could come from the poorest family in town and yet receive a high-quality education that would enable you to go anywhere and compete with the graduates of Exeter or Andover. The envy-laded concept of elitism has been thrown at these and other high-quality schools across the country, and political pressures have been put on them to admit more students without such high academic skills. Seldom do the people who push such notions stop to think that you cannot let everyone go to Stuyvesant without it ceasing to be the kind of school that makes them want to go there. You cannot teach everyone at the same pace unless that pace is slowed down to accommodate the lowest common denominator. There are kids who can handle calculus in the 10th grade, and others who struggle with it in college. Ironically, many so-called minority leaders have led the charge to get top-level public schools to admit students on some basis other than academic achievement. Yet no one needs such schools more than poor and disadvantaged children who want to rise to higher levels in the economy and the society. There may not be a high percentage of minority students who are currently able to take advantage of outstanding high schools, but part of the reason is that the elementary schools in many minority communities have deteriorated so much since the days when I went to PS5 in Harlem. Kids in PS5 in the 1940s had test scores equal to those of white kids in the immigrant neighborhoods on the Lower East Side. One revealing statistic is that more black boys went to Stuyvesant in 1938 than in 1983, even though the black population of New York was much smaller in 1938. Moreover, those black kids who did not want to make the long trip from Harlem down to Stuyvesant had some decent high schools available to them closer to home. In Washington, D.C., the similarly old and battered Dunbar High School has likewise been replaced by a modern building. But the new Dunbar is not even in the same league with the old school that once housed the finest black high school in the nation. Back in the 1930s, Dunbar's all-black student body had test scores above the national average while going to a rundown school with overcrowded classes. The old Dunbar turned out the first black general, the first black federal judge, the first black cabinet member, and on and on. More than one-fourth of the Dunbar graduates who later graduated from Amherst College during the period from 1892 to 1954 graduated Phi Beta Kappa. Of the few high-level black military officers in World War II, more than two dozen with ranks of major to brigadier general were Dunbar graduates. You might think that black political leaders would move heaven and earth to preserve a school like this, but you would be wrong. The Marion Barry generation of leaders in Washington have promoted the same class warfare envy found in the larger society and denounced the very memory of this elitist school whose quality was destroyed overnight back in the 1950s by turning it into a neighborhood school. May Stuyvesant and other high schools like it escape the sad fate of Dunbar.